Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to this space, welcome to this time, welcome to Crossroads on this Tuesday morning. It is another week of coming together after hard news. It's another week of coming together after tragedy. And this is getting harder. It's getting harder to stand in front of you and to say, let's pray over this again. But we do, because that is what we do. And so I invite you in this time to put away those things that may distract you, that baggage that you brought into the room with you, whether it is physical or not. Put it away and join in this community for worship. And I thank you for that music because it reminds me that in heavy times that feel dark, we insist upon light. And that is our job, is to insist upon light, whether we feel like it or not. Our own community here at Mars Hill has lost two members in the past week. We lost Bob Chapman, who had been retired for a long time and yet was very, very much a part of the community. And we lost Jane Renfro, whom some of you as students may know. Um, she retired not long ago because of her health. And she passed away on Sunday. And this is a loss to us. And then the news tells us that loss and grief are nationwide. And so I invite us to begin this morning, having put aside that baggage, having put aside the things that we brought in with us to distract us, let us begin this morning with a moment of silence. Please join me in that. Being short on words of my own, I offer you a statement from John Dorhauer, who is the general minister and president of the UCC. What he says this week is, I am fast losing the capacity to mourn all that we must mourn. Charlottesville becomes Houston, becomes Florida, becomes Puerto Rico, becomes Las Vegas. Every lost life is a name, a history, a hope, a story, an unfulfilled future. Every lost life leaves behind loved ones who mourn and grieve and piece together a future of their own torn asunder by matters we cannot comprehend. I can't find words to capture this pain, this collective grief and anger. I cannot reach deep enough into my soul to express fully the pain, the anger, the rage, the confusion, the anxiety, the emptiness. When will it end? And what must I do to respond with meaning, with purpose, with intent, so that whatever hope we talk about on the other side of this is not vapid and vain? I feel utterly powerless. God help us all. Inspire imagination. Inspire hope. Inspire healing, inspire resistance, inspire something new and something bold and something grand. This cannot be our ongoing narrative. We have to want something better than this. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let us pray. Holy God, we, your children gathered here, are grieving, and we, your children gathered here, are hurting, or are numb, or are overwhelmed into paralysis, or even into apathy. Help us, God. Walk with us through the grief and pain 
allow it to remind us of our humanity, allow it to expand our capacity for compassion, to lead us to greater mercy, greater forgiveness, greater commitment to justice, peace, and love. We mourn here in this community for the lives of two people dear to us whom we have lost in the past week, and we lift the families and loved ones of Bob Chapman and of Jane Renfro. We mourn as a nation for the destruction in Puerto Rico, for lives lost in numbers yet uncounted. We mourn the destruction, too, in the Virgin Islands, in Florida, in Texas. And we lift those to you whose lives have been changed forever, knowing that rebuilding will be a long and exhausting process. We mourn as a nation for the unfathomable terror and violence in Las Vegas. We mourn that one man was able to bring with an arsenal of weapons created for the sole purpose of taking lives. When, O oh God, will we learn your way of love? When will the words of Isaiah come true, that we will beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks? When will we cease to train for war? We pray for those who lost loved ones in this terrible time and for those who will never be able to wipe the fear and chaos of that night from memory. We pray that you would lead us, God, in a better way, that you would train us for love, teach us the way of kindness, that we will not move on to the next tragedy in apathy or fear or numbness, but that we would allow ourselves to be changed and moved to a deeper commitment to your kingdom. Be with us, God, this day, this moment, in this place, as we seek you, as we seek to glorify you through worship, to be transformed by your presence, and to insist upon light. Bless the service. Bless the preacher and her words, the musicians and their music, the reading of scripture and the singing of hymns. Let us not leave here unchanged. Amen. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 58. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Good morning. Or should I just start the way I start my classes? Hey. <laughs> that would be more authentic, wouldn't it? And peach tea, which is what I always have in my classes. Decaffeinated, it's important. It's always a privilege to be in the pulpit, and I'm grateful to be invited into this one, so thank you. I want us all to take a long, slow, deep breath. Just breathe in and breathe out slowly. Just come on. We're in a sanctuary. It's a place of peace, and we need some of that, don't we? especially in traumatic times, devastation by hurricanes, another horrific shooting. Sometimes it's all we can do just to breathe. Sometimes that's enough. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. We're in midterm evaluation week, and I might be projecting, but some of us are tired. Maybe stressed with exams and papers and grades. And my temptation, although I did not give in to it today, was to read from Acts chapter 20 about Eutychus. You know about Eutychus? The Apostle Paul preached long into the night, well after midnight, and the poor kid sitting on the third story window ledge fell asleep and fell out to the ground below, three stories below. Brother Paul, the intrepid explorer, got down there and picked him up alive. You might feel like Eutychus a little bit, like one more long lecture might just do you in, whether you're hearing it or whether you're giving it. The Bible says that it will not do you in. The last week was the International Coffee Day, and that is celebrating God's gift for people who are tired. Can I get a witness? But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Sunday was World Communion Day. Lots of congregations share bread and wine from the table of Christ, share it with people around the globe, and if only our communities and our nation could mimic that kind of welcome, Christ's welcome. World Communion means everybody gets bread, the bread of life. And if that were true, friends, Maybe we wouldn't have more than three million children dying of hunger-related causes around the globe every year, would we? And tomorrow begins Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles. It remembers the 40 years that the children of Israel wandered in the desert while God provided them manna while they lived in temporary shelters, enough manna to feed everyone, plenty. God still provides enough manna for us now. We have enough grain to feed everybody, but we feed livestock instead so that rich countries eat meat and poor countries starve. Sunday was World Vegetarian Day. I just suggest that um, being vegetarian could save lives and slow climate change, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. People often ask in times of tragedy. They maybe experience a bit of a crisis of faith. They say things like, where is Jesus in all of this? And that's what I'm here to talk about. Now, stay with me because we got to go around the mountain to get back to this. So hang on. Pray with me. God of all creation, create in us a willing spirit to hear you. Create in us enough love to recognize you, to see you, to welcome you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. One more time, that last verse from our scripture in Luke chapter 9. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I have somewhere to lay my head. I have two somewheres. I live in the mountains of North Georgia every weekend and during breaks. And I live just up the street Monday through Thursday during the school year. I have two homes when some people don't even have one. Now, not having a home is not a character flaw. It's a financial status. 
It's not a reason to be despised or judged. People who lack homes are still created in the image of God. Duh. Previously, I served a nonprofit that welcomed homeless and impoverished and formerly incarcerated friends, and every last one of them was a child of God created in God's image. According to our text, today Jesus was homeless, or I like to say underhoused, too, for a while. Now, I have two attorneys in North Georgia, my little town there, one of whose name is Brett Jones. Brett did the closing for our cabin, so she was with us on one of the happiest days of my life. She also did our wills, which is important, but not quite as happy a time. In Brett's office, she has a bunch of these shiny sculptures sitting around, displayed. Some of them are flowers and animals, and my personal favorite is the aardvark. And some of them are words like love and peace, and my favorite there is the one that says resistance. These uh, wire art sculptures, they range from simple to complex. They cost maybe 10, 15, 20, 25 dollars at the most. And they're all shiny and they're really cool. When we asked her about this wire art, uh, Brett told us that the artist was a man named Keith, who's homeless. And she sells these wire art sculptures for him out of her law office. Now, some folks don't like uh, helping underhoused people with handouts, although there's nothing wrong with a handout when someone's hungry or cold or suffering. And even if you don't get that now, if you're ever hungry or cold or suffering, you'll get it then. Um, but Americans are pretty good about offering handouts when there's a major catastrophe like a storm that leaves folks homeless temporarily. But maybe we're not so great about offering handouts when folks are homeless year-round. We look at those two things differently somehow. But attorney Brett was not offering homeless Keith a handout. She didn't condescend to him with pity or anything like that. She did something else entirely. She did something better. She gave him admiration for his art. Respect as a human being, a platform to share his gifts with the community, a way to earn money for his talent. She honored him as an equal, a person with creativity, a person with something to contribute, not flawed because he didn't have a house, not less than, not judged. She saw him as a brother. The wire art sells pretty good from uh, Brett's law office. It's a busy office, and with his earnings last year, Keith was able to purchase a motor for his bicycle. That's his only mode of transportation. He was able to live indoors in the winter when the weather was too cold for him to live outside at his campsite. When I heard this story, I said, Brett, it is so cool that you do that. That's just great, because it is. I was just overstating the obvious. And Brett leaned in and she put her arm around me and her eyes got all shiny and she whispered, I do it because it keeps me close to Jesus. Apparently, attorneys have to whisper when they say Jesus. Uh, now, Jesus had no place to lay his head not multiple dwellings like me or like some of you. I mean, you live at home, you live at school, some of you. Even some professors do that, have multiple dwellings or maybe even vacation homes. But Jesus was like Keith. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, whatever you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. As individual people and as groups and as communities, even as a nation, Maybe especially as a nation, we have some pretty messed up relationships. But when we look into the eyes of another human being, especially someone from the margins, someone who's hurting, someone who's vulnerable, Jesus says that's where we find and love and serve him. It is in building those relationships with vulnerable and struggling people that we build our relationship 
to God. It's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Our world can be such a harsh place. A few too many loud haters out there. Can I get a witness? Unjust systems and mean-spirited attitudes won't change, not until we care and care enough and care actively about people who are suffering until it's personal, until someone without a home matters enough to you, until someone living a difficult life that you can't even imagine finds a place in your heart and in your actions and in your efforts, nothing's going to change. But just as soon as you know and care enough about one person who has no place to be, just one, one homeless person in whom you can look into their eyes and meet Jesus, everything changes. Now, attorneys are smart. But they might not always have the best reputations, maybe, for being loving or kind or compassionate. I don't know if you've heard that kind of thing or not. I'm here to change that notion. Just look at Dr. Hahn, awesome attorney and professor. Think about that for a minute. If a wealthy attorney in North Georgia named Brett can meet Jesus in her relationship of respect and admiration for an underhouse man named Keith, and care enough about him to take action. I'm betting that Keith can find Jesus in his relationship with a wealthy attorney named Brett, even though that might be hard too. If they can do that, if they can meet Christ in each other, then surely the rest of us can do our work. One authentic, caring enough relationship at a time. Now, in times of crisis when faith can be shaken, people say things like, where is Jesus in all of this? I told you I'd get back around to this if you waited. Uh, what is Jesus doing about all of this? Well, I have a couple of responses. There are other responses, but these are mine. First, I would say, where are you in all of this? Did you pray? Well, great. But don't stop there. Did you raise awareness? That's important. Get the facts and spread them. Facts being a key word there. Did you make a donation of some sort, needed items, or money, or a pint of blood, or hours of volunteer work? Did you do something like that? If you did, that's awesome. Did you put yourself out there in whatever way you're able? And are we doing the work of justice, directing our efforts toward preventing this sort of tragedy in the future? What needs to change? Are we moving forward for the changes that need to happen? You know, we really can't complain about the next tragedy if we aren't willing to engage the one we've got right now. That's my first answer. When you say, where's Jesus and all this? I would say, where are you? And then second, if we are looking for Jesus, we need to find people who are usually excluded, shoved aside, judged, suffering, maybe even despised. We need to reach out to those marginalized folks, not with pity, not with condescension, but with respect and care. We need to look into their eyes. We need to care enough. We need to see them. We need to hear them. We need to welcome them with love. We need to respect them as equals. And there is where we'll find Jesus. He'll be waiting for us there. And that, friends, is the good news. Amen. Today, and I pray that your ears were open, your eyes are open, your hearts remain open to continued change from what you have heard. Stand with me now and let us sing hymn number 472. It says 47. It is 472. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
receive this benediction. Friends, as you go, may your eyes remain opened. May you seek to find Jesus in the eyes of the person across from you. May you seek to find Jesus among those who need you to find Jesus in them. May your hearts be opened. May you go from here with greater peace, with greater love, with greater commitment to God's kingdom in this world. Amen.